Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody back, and we'll go into our program two this afternoon. And again, for those of you joining us on television, we run four of these programs in an afternoon, and uh, we just appreciate so much your response, your prayers, your financial help, and uh, how we appreciate testimonies, how that the Lord has brought salvation to so many through our simple teaching of the Word, and again, very soul and spirit. And uh, so we always give the Spirit all the credit for what is being accomplished. Again, we like to thank even our studio audience for coming in, being a part of this. All right, now we started in our last program on a series that we're going to run, I don't know how long it'll take, of the covenants that God has made with the human race or with Israel. And uh, in our last program, we got only as far as the first part of the second covenant. And I guess I can again review a little bit for the television audience. We have seven of these covenants coming up through Scripture. We got the covenant concerning Eden before the fall, the Adamic, which really sets the stage for human experience under the curse. Then we come to the Noahic covenant as a response to the flood. And then in the center, now I, I meant to point this out in the very first program. You'll notice that there are three covenants on each side of what I call the linchpin of all covenants, the Abrahamic. And so you've got these three before the call of Abraham, and then you have the Mosaic, the Palestinian, and the Davidic after the call of Abraham, and then we have the New Covenant, which will kick in in the Kingdom Age, which of course will take place at the end of time as we know it. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take these three, I'm only going to touch on the Abrahamic Covenant. We're going to move on to the other three. And then I'm going to hopefully sometime down the road come and deal more extensively then with the Abrahamic and those new covenants. So now in this program, we're going to continue on into the second segment of the second covenant, the Adamic. All right, and that means we will come back where we left off in Genesis chapter 3. And uh, we can now go down into verse 15. We dealt with how God is going to deal with Satan and his experiences as they will unfold throughout the 6,000 years of human experience. And now verse 15. And I, God says, will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Now that's the crucial part of that verse, and we'll come back to the last part a little later. But this running belligerent attitude then between Satan and God begins with Adam and will not end until he is finally taken off the scene completely at the end of the tribulation, only to be released a little while again at uh, the end of the millennial kingdom. But here is what one famous pastor years ago referred to then as the scarlet thread of redemption that runs all the way from Genesis 3.15 to the end of the human experience. And we're going to just chase it down because, again, Satan knowing that the only way God can remain God is to keep all of this intact. And if Satan can do anything to destroy this scarlet thread of redemption, then the whole thing falls apart. Now, it starts right off as soon as Adam and Eve have the two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain rises up and kills Abel. Well, in our day and time, it's just another murder. But so far as Cain and Abel was concerned, it was Satan's attempt to immediately break that scarlet line of redemption because the Redeemer was to come through Abel and certainly not Cain. Now, in order to pick up that thread of redemption, I'm just going to take the easy way out, and I'm going to jump all the way up to Matthew chapter 1, and then we'll have to finish the genealogies or the silver thread or the uh, scarlet thread in Luke chapter 3. 
But first, let's look at the genealogies in chapter 1. Now, it's been a long time since we've done this on the program, so I hope I'm not guilty of repeating something that doesn't need repeating. But again, one of the intricacies of Scripture is that Matthew's genealogy of Christ's first advent only goes from Christ back to Abraham. And that, of course, the reason is that the king is what Matthew presents, and the king was an unknown entity of Scripture until we get to Abraham. So Matthew's genealogy will only go from Abraham until we get to the coming of Christ in his first advent, and then we'll have to pick up Luke chapter 3 to find the genealogy from Abraham back to Adam. Now, if you'll turn me then to Matthew chapter 1, and we start out with verse 1, that this is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the one that was born at Bethlehem, who is referred to here as the son of David. And that course kicks right back to the Davidic covenant. That's what the covenant was all about, that through the line of David would come Israel's Redeemer and Messiah. All right, the son of David, who was, of course, the son of Abraham. Now here comes the genealogy. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, and so on and so forth. And you come all the way down through this genealogy, generation after generation, until you come all the way down to verse 16. Not the same Jacob of Abraham and Isaac, but a Jacob of Christ's time, begat, or was the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And Mary was the one who, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. All right, now then, if you skip over to Luke chapter 3, we can pick up the rest of that scarlet line of redemption that Satan constantly attempted to disrupt, but God providentially prevented him. Now in Luke 3, starting at verse 23, we start from the birth of Christ and go backwards. Now Matthew started with Abraham and came forwards. But here Luke is going to do just the opposite. And again, we won't read all the names. I merely want to make the point that here we have that constant genealogical line all the way from Adam up to Jesus and his birth in Bethlehem. All right, verse 23 of Luke chapter 3. And Jesus himself began to be at the age of 30 years, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. And of course, we know that Joseph was not his physical father. He was merely the legal father. And so Joseph was of Heli, and Heli was the son of Mathot, and so on down. And we're not going to read all these names, but you can do that in your spare time. And then all of a sudden you come on down to verse... Oh, let's just jump in where the names get familiar. <clears throat> Verse 34. Verse 34. Who was the son of Jacob? Who was the son of Isaac? Who was the son of Abraham? Who was the son of Terah? Now we're going beyond what Matthew had. Who was the son of Nahor? Son of Phalek? And all the way down to verse 37, Noah now was the son of Methuselah. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. And Enoch was the son of Jared, who was the son of Malaleel, who was the son of Canaan, who was the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth. Now that name rings a bell. He's the one who took Abel's place. And Seth was the son of Adam, who was, of course, the son of God by virtue of creation. All right, now then, if you just look at human history, and one of the more graphic examples is the book of Esther. And in the book of Esther, you remember that this one wicked individual in the government of that time, I think it was King Artaxerxes, 
he got the grand idea that if he could just get the king to make a decree to destroy every Jew in the kingdom, then he would rise to a place of preeminence because he hated the Jews. Well, he almost made it work. But you see, the queen was a Jewess, and she intervened on behalf of her people, and of course, through God's providence, Queen Esther was able to stop the decree. Haman instead went to the gallows instead of the Jew that he was trying to get rid of. And so the scarlet line continued on. But always remember, from day one, from the very onset of Adam coming out of the garden, Satan is going to do everything in his power to thwart the fulfillment of his prophetic program. And of course, at the heart of it, once we get past Abraham, is the nation of Israel. And I'm always pointing that out, especially in my local classes. Don't ever wonder why the Jews are so hated by mankind in general. It isn't because they deserve the hatred, it's because Satan knows that they are instrumental in fulfilling all the promises of God. And if you take the Jew off the scene, then the whole Bible falls apart. Because you cannot have end time prophecy without Israel in the land. And so even today, why is the Arab world so intent <clears throat> on driving every last Israeli into the Mediterranean Sea? Well, it isn't just the Arab world, it's the Satan behind it who is determined to get rid of the nation of Israel so that he can be the winner and God will be the loser. But you see, fortunately, God is still the all-powerful and God has decreed that it will never happen. And again, the way things are shaking out in the Middle East, we know that the peace process once again is becoming front page news. But behind the scenes, remember, there's still that satanic effort that no matter what the little nation of Israel does, he wants it to be their demise. He wants it to set the stage for their final destruction. And of course, I haven't even mentioned Hitler and the Holocaust. That again was another satanic endeavor to get rid of the Jew, to cleanse the earth of every last one of them. And then of course, Satan would be victorious. But fortunately, we have the promises of scripture that God is always going to be superior. Now drop back with me a minute to Jeremiah 31, because we know there are so many, especially uh, prominent preachers and Bible teachers, who take this approach that God's all through with Israel, that even the Jews that claim to be Jews aren't Jews at all, they're imposters. Well, I beg to differ on the basis of the Word of God. And we've used these verses before, and we'll probably use them again, especially when we get to the New Covenant. Jeremiah 31, and drop down to verse 35. See, this just guarantees that in spite of all of Satan's power, in spite of his fomenting the hatred of the Jew, God has mandated that it's not going to happen. Israel is not going to disappear. All right, Jeremiah 31, drop down to verse 35. Thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night. In other words, he's in control of all of the universe. Every body of space is under his control. And like I've mentioned in previous programs, have you ever stopped to think that with all those billions upon billions and upon billions of stars and bodies in space, they're not crashing into each other? They're all in perfect harmony one with another. Why? Well, that's no accident. The Creator God is in control. All right, now He is in such control of the universe, then how much more can He control our little solar system? Because it is just a little nothing compared to the whole. But here it is, that if the sun and the moon and the stars by night which divide the sea, now verse 36, if that's the condition, that if those ordinances depart, in other words, if the moon should fall out of its orbit, if the sun would suddenly burn out and quit sustaining the universe, 
if the Son and all these things would cease uh, from being, and if they should depart, then the Lord says, the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me. Verse 37, he gives another analogy. If heaven can be measured and the foundations of the earth can be searched out beneath, then I will cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done, because absolutely they have not been the most obedient people. They've been anything but. But as we're going to see coming up through these covenants in, previous, in the coming program, God does not give up on the nation of Israel. He's still going to have that remnant left for the end time events. But he says, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done. But it's not going to happen. And so we have this guarantee that the scarlet line of redemption is going to be fulfilled, which of course led to his first advent. But we also have the guarantee that all of the end time prophecies promised to the nation of Israel will come to fulfillment in spite of everything. In fact, in light of the present day headlines, I'm going to take you back a minute. This thought just came to mind. Come back with me to Matthew 24. Because every one of us as believers, every one of us who love the nation of Israel, simply because they are God's chosen people, we have to understand why things are taking place the way they are. All right, in Matthew 24, which of course is all tribulation, we're not there yet, we're not in the tribulation, although I think we're, we're getting close. I know we're getting closer. I've said that before. We know we're getting closer. But look at Matthew 24, verse 9. And as you see the world's hatred and the pressure from all the governments of the world to Israel to give in to the demands of the Palestinians and hating them if they don't. This is what the Lord himself said. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then, that is when the tribulation comes in, then shall they, that is all the other segments of the world, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, they shall kill you, and you shall be, what? Hated. Now this is scripture. This is what we can stand on. That the Jewish people are going to be hated of all nations because they're so despicable? No. Why? For his name's sake. Because he has decreed, and we're going to see that in coming covenants, he has decreed that they are his covenant people. And no matter how much they rebel, no matter how much the majority may be in disobedience, yet God's mercy, as he says, will never depart from them. All right, now in the few moments we have left, time's going fast. Let's go back again, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3, where we have this running confrontation between Satan and the seed of the woman which, of course, is a reference to Christ. And then, the seed, the seed of Satan, no, the seed of the woman, I'm sorry, verse 15, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of Satan, which, of course, took place at the cross. When Christ finished the work of the cross, he signaled a total victorious power over Satan and all of his demonic powers. So that's where his head was crushed, but because of the suffering that Christ entailed, <clears throat> he would bruise the Messiah's heel. And so here is the whole big picture of redemption and the coming of the Redeemer and the running battle between the two here in verse 15. All right, now then. We're going to move on to the third part of this Adamic covenant, which is God's dealing with the woman. Now, you know, it's amazing how many phone calls I get. Had one again the other day, which reminded me of it, that after all, it was Eve who ate first, and Eve precipitated the curse. No, no. Eve ate first, but she was not responsible. 
She was caught in a moment of weakness, didn't realize what she was doing, and before she knew it, she had eaten. But, and here's the vast difference, and this is what folks have to understand. The curse came about because of Adam's disobedience, not Eve. But Eve is not left scot-free, and so we'll look at hers first in verse 16. Here is what's going to happen to the female part of the race because of Eve's failure to understand what she was doing. So unto the woman, he, God, said, I will great, greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, childbearing. For in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Now, you know, I, I make people smile <clears throat> when I refer to the kingdom where flesh and blood people, of course, are going to come in at the front end and they're going to have children. And they're going to be living the whole thousand years. I read another article by a well-known theologian the other day and he affirmed my same thinking, that they're going to live the whole thousand year period of time. Well now, ladies, you can smile if you want. But you see, if they have children now without the curse of the pain of childbearing, having children is going to be the most delightful thing on earth. And I think they're going to have hundreds. <laughs> I really do. I think women are going to have children throughout that whole thousand year period of time and every child will be a delight because there's not even the pain of delivery or anything because that was brought about by the curse. Okay, so now back to my text. This is what the curse brought on the female of the human race. Sorrow in bringing forth children and then wonder of wonders, the feminists should really smile at this. It's because of the curse that the woman has been subjected to the headship of the man. And that's another thing that people can't get through their head. Why should women be subjected to the husband? Because Eve ate first. And that much God is going to put on her because of her not knowing better and succumb to the wiles of Satan. So that's all part of the curse as it fell on the female of the human race, the sorrow and the pain of childbearing, but also that the woman is to be uh, subservient to the husband. All right, now let's just go look at a, at a few of the Pauline verses with regard to that. And this is exactly why Paul writes what he writes, is because of what God covenanted back here in Genesis chapter 3. The first one I want to refer to is in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. And so the next, why should women be subservient to their husbands? This is the reason. Ephesians chapter 5, we got to drop down to verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another. In other words, this is what makes for good relationships, whether it's in the home or in the local church or in a work environment. It's giving in one to another. Now, verse 22, wives, submit. You all know what that word means. It is just give in. It's wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as, this is what makes the difference, as unto the Lord. Now, when we come into the spiritual picture of all this, it makes beautiful sense. Next verse, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as, now here's, here's the biblical perspective. The husband is over the wife as Christ is the head of the church, that is the church which is his body. Now goodness sakes, does Christ ever make life miserable for members of the body? No. He's a benevolent head. And of course the lesson is that's what we as men are to be to our wives. We are to be benevolent instruments and never just make them feel like a second class citizen, which too many husbands do. But the whole concept is that the husband is going to be the head of the wife because Eve in a weak moment ate of the fruit of the tree. 
All right, now I've only got a couple minutes left. I'm amazed how fast they go. Now come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And here again, Paul is going to deal with the subserviency of the woman to the husband. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And drop down to verse 11. And you have no idea how many phone calls I got on this one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all, what? Subjection, submission, see? Now here's the reason. Verse 12. For I permit not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. That's the key statement. Now, I tell people all the time, women can teach, women can pray, women can do all kinds of things in the local church, but scripturally, they should not be the senior pastor. I make no apology for that. But on the other hand, I will say this sometimes, that God has always been a God with a direct will, but also a permissive will. And there may be instances where he will permit a lady to maybe from keeping a church, a small little church out in the boondocks where men will not go or whatever the case may be, mission fields where God may permit a woman to be the minister or the pastor in order to keep the church from going down completely. But God's original purpose is that the man should be the one in authority. My goodness, only got a minute left. Now verse 13, here's the reason. Here's the biblical reason. For Adam was first formed. Adam was created first. And then Eve. Now here's the second part of the reason. Adam was not deceived. So the curse fell because of Adam. He knew what he was doing. But the woman being deceived was still in the transgression. She was still guilty. All right, then verse 15, notwithstanding, even though she was part and parcel of it, she shall be saved in childbearing. Now, that doesn't mean her own children, but she'll be saved by the childbearing, which is a reference to Christ. So the woman will be saved by the work of the cross, just like the man. But the order of the sexes was established back at the beginning. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.